I think that a lot of people think that the projects of literature and the projects of science are different projects, maybe even in some way opposed to each other. And for me, uh, in a very fundamental way, I see them as being part of the same project, which is to understand reality and to understand the world that we live in. Uh, in other words, to get at something like the truth of our existence and the reality around our existence. So for me, the, it's not that the purposes of the two are different, it's that the technologies that they use in order to achieve their purposes are different. And because um, the methodologies of science reveal the world in a different kind of way than the methodologies of literature, I'm actually really interested in how they work because I think that depending on how it is you, that you come to your perceptions of reality, depending on how it is that you come to your truth, you may find that you have a different relationship to that truth or that reality. My month in Antarctica was about as much fun as it's possible to have in a 30-odd day space of time. And uh, what I did was I spent as much time with the scientists as I possibly could, and uh, as much time playing uh, as I possibly could, and then also um, making notes, writing poems, reading uh, the writings of previous explorers, especially the early explorers, Shackleton, Scott, Amundsen, to people like that and then trying to come to some sense of what the reality of that place was and what it meant to me so that I could produce poems about it. Well, the first time I moved from poetry to fiction was almost a kind of an accident. I had finished my first collection of poems. It represented in some ways everything I had learned as a baby poet in graduate school, as a student. It represented my relationship to the dominant poetics of the moment, which was the free verse confessional poem. And it also really represented, for me, a dead end, because um, I wasn't a likely candidate for a whole career in free verse confessional poetry. There just hasn't been enough bad that's happened to me in my life. I'm a very lucky person. I've let my childhood was boring, by which I mean it was happy. Uh, happy childhoods are basically uneventful ones, uh, I think, and mine was uneventful. So in that first book, I had pretty much written about every bad thing that had ever happened to me up to that point. And I wasn't really planning to have a lot of bad things happen to me. You know, I wasn't going to be seeking bad things to happen to me. So I needed to figure out how to do something else. And I think that I knew at that point, there were a couple of poems in that book that really gestured toward what would come later in the poetry, which was the poems about science, about perception, about reality. But I wasn't sure how to get to that material. There wasn't a good model, a contemporary model for me at that time. So I thought, well, I've got to do something, so I might as well write a novel, because who knows, maybe somebody would actually buy a novel. Little did I know that the novel I was likely to, buy, to write was not the novel that somebody was likely, was likely to buy. But I sat out on this project. Um, it took me several years to write the first novel. To be honest, it's not actually a novel that I would recommend that people read. I don't think it's a very good novel in spite of the the very intensive labor that I put into it. But I discovered when I finished that I had quite unexpectedly gained some of the tools that I needed to move forward in my poetry. And specifically, among the tools that I had gained were, I think, an increased vocal flexibility. The ability really to speak uh, across a number of different vocal registers instead of in this singular free verse, first person, confessional voice. I got the Guggenheim the third time I applied. And as soon as I got it, I began to realize that I should have been applying probably every single year after my first or at least after my second book came out, and that's the advice that I would give to any writer, because we don't know when the middle of our careers begin. Uh, and also because I think, as with so many other things, uh, there's a, there are a number of different forces that come to bear on whether in a given year you're likely to get the award. And 
I think that if you, if the year you happen not to apply is the year in which things were lining up in a way that was maybe going to be favorable to you, then you may have lost your chance really forever. So once you're in that position of being possibly thought of as mid-career or having the kind of credentials behind you where you might be considered, you're silly not to be applying every single year. I wasn't applying every single year because I thought, oh, I'm never going to get it. Right? And the year I got it, I was putting out a number of different applications. I thought, well, I might as well just adapt it one more time for the Guggenheim. How long could it possibly take? The Poetry Foundation brought me in as the inaugural director of the Harriet Monroe Poetry Institute uh, to create something that I think of as a kind of think tank for poetry. And they were actually looking for a permanent full-time director, but I was not prepared to leave academia. So we agreed that I would come in for two years and put into place some kind of structure that would then allow uh, the institute to exist in the world and maybe have other people come in and become the directors. And one of the things that was interesting to me is that I did um, several different related projects several different projects, some of which were related. The first one was really focused on the question of why poetry wasn't coming into uh, the online communities, onto electronic uh, platforms as readily as one might have expected, um, given that poetry in some ways seems sort of made for electronic media. Now this has actually changed quite a lot in the five or so years since I was starting at the Poetry Foundation. But at that time, one of the things that we discovered in making our report was that a lot of poets, and especially more traditional poets, were very nervous about things like copyright and fair use. So this sent us into uh, what I thought was a really interesting exploration of copyright. We published not only um, the, the first poetry and new media report but also went on to bring together focus groups of poets to talk about um, questions of copyright and fair use and what they thought would be the best practices around copyright and fair use and that resulted in some best practices documents that are now out there for the poetry community to use. Then the second project was something completely different which was an anthology uh, of solicited essays by poets who have done, I, I thought, really interesting work in bringing poetry into different kinds of communities across the United States, whether they be the barrios of Los Angeles or um, high schools in different kinds of places. Robert Hass's River of Words project was one of these projects. Elizabeth Alexander wrote about Cave Canem. Um, so there, were, uh, there was a range of the kinds of ways in which we were conceiving of communities. So they wrote essays about their experience doing this, and then um, we created what I call a toolkit, which was kind of a, an a appendix that was half the book that was basically um, a book of ideas for people who are interested in doing this kind of work in their own communities. So how do you figure out how to raise money? who gives grants for these kinds of things, how do you approach potential venues, how do you approach local businesses, how do you get volunteers on board. And um, For me this was one of the most uh, satisfying things that we did in the Institute, partly because it really did get out into the world and I visit places, I was in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago and somebody came up and said, are you Catherine Coles? And I said, yes, thinking they were going to ask me about my poems. And, and the young woman said, you did that amazing book on bringing poetry into communities. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, so it's getting out there, and people are actually using it, including in places like Africa. Eve, don't consult the cost. Rather, mind the body, coarse, occluded, lost in its heedlessness, it finds itself too heady to consult the cost. Balance grace and dross, weigh desire and duty. Cursed, occult, lost in my nakedness, mea culpa, steady.
I can't account the cost of what I've won. At least I kept my word. I'd stay any course to lose everything like this, to be everybody's curse. I cut my losses. I do not mind the cost.